Alhamdulillah. And um, the reason that we chose the book that we're going to be looking at, book 36 of the Ihya, is because this is a blessed community. And I think it is a community that is open to receiving these meanings. Because that uh, we're good, yeah. These meanings are very deep. And that what we're going to be looking at over these next few sessions today is what I believe to be the essential aspect of our deen. At the very heart of what it means to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That uh, this book, book 36 of the Ihya al-Muddin, the Kitab al-Muhabbati wa shawki wa unsi wa rida. The book on love, longing, intimacy and contentment that is that the whole goal of religion. This is what it's all about. This is why we do everything that we do. And that many of you have heard me speak about Imam Ghazali before, so we won't go into a great introduction uh, about him, uh, that his scholarship will suffice. Uh, the one thing that we will say is that, that he is titled and he's been given the epithet Hujjat al-Islam. He is the proof of Islam. And that has a diverse meanings. One of the great meanings of that is that his life in and of itself is a testimony to the truth of La ilaha illallah. And of all of the great contributions that he left behind, perhaps the greatest contribution of all is the contribution of the way that he chose to live his life. Meaning that he made a decision in his life and that we were speaking yesterday in the khutbah about the importance of decisions. And when he made that decision in his life to leave the Nidhamiya and to take a path to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to attain sincerity and to actualize what it means to prefer the next world over this world, Allah ta'ala showered upon him all of these blessings that we now are reading that over 950 years later. But it was a result of that decision that he made. And in a sense, to even call it a decision uh, might be a bit questionable because that in a sense that he was beloved to Allah and he was forced because he was going back and forth. He was wavering. And then it reached a point where he couldn't speak and he was actually forced to do what it is that he knew in his heart that he needed to do. But that he was a person of utter sincerity and that his training from the early periods is that we find in all of these different stages is that Hujjat islam is that he was a, confronted and he was exposed to scholars that focused upon the science of the heart and that we also tend to forget is that his brother that Imam Ahmed al-Ghazali was also an Imam and he has a great diwan of poetry much of which is about the love of Allah and the Messenger of Allah and that he was a great scholar and that he was known for being a very pious person and a person that, that really, in a sense, that laid down many of the foundations for even later Persian poets to speak about uh, divine love in the way that they did. That anyhow, that the Ihya al this is his greatest work, and it's divided into four parts. That the first half of the Ihya is dealing with outward knowledge in general. The second half is dealing with inward knowledge. The first quarter, because if you divide into two halves, each half has two quarters. The first quarter deals with the basics, the basics of belief, the basics of what we believe about knowledge, and then the ibadat, the forms of worship. The second quarter of the first half deals with the mu'aminat, the practical dealings, marriage, buying and selling, knowledge of the halal and the haram, and so forth. And then the second half was deals with internal knowledge, inner knowledge, is that is also divided into two quarters. The first quarter is what is called the muhlikat, the destructive vices, whereby he lays down for us that how we understand that we can destroy ourselves religiously. There's certain things that are destructive and that they're not in our own benefit. And that he lays this down in the third quarter. Then the fourth quarter are the munjiat, which are the saving virtues. Now, that someone might say, why are we skipping to book 36? That if there's really these things called muhlikat, destructive vices, why are we skipping to the saving virtues? And that 
one, that we don't really have the time to begin with book one, that we did a class at Tetlif years ago, I think, what, two or three years ago, on book one, and it took us, subhanAllah, just to get through, I mean, it took us, what, two semesters or something, at least, to get through the book. And um, we were going quickly. That if you really would get down and to explain line by line, it would take you a long time to um, explain the Ahlul Madin. Uh, it would take you a long time to even read it fully from cover to cover in all four volumes. Uh, however, that <clears throat> the second reason is, is that there's something special about this particular virtue. That even if we call it a saving virtue, it is something that is munji, najat is salvation. And something that is munji is something that leads to salvation. Is that love is important because that love is one of the greatest ways of all to not only attain salvation and sanctification, but that it in and of itself obliterates and burns up the destructive vices. So in a sense that if, yes, someone that has those destructive vices might be prevented in a sense from the higher levels of this love, but at the other way of the other way of looking at this to the degree that one has their heart opened up to this love is also to the degree that those various destructive vices are also going to wither away and so that this is this is really important and um it just quite simply is one of my favorite books uh, of the ihya uh, along with the kitab shurh ajaib al qalb book 21 which is about uh the explanation of the wonders of the heart and that this, in a sense, is a response that, as many of the, the all of the books are, really, in, in the second half of the Ihya, that to the foundations that are laid in Book 21, which is the book on the, the wonders of the heart. And we have to say, uh, also by way of introduction, is that there is this idea that some people have, is that love is not an integral part of our religion. And we've talked about this before, but we really want to hammer this point home. That if you ever hear someone saying that, that it's just clearly a sign that they know nothing about their religion. But you'll hear this. you heal people even oftentimes uh, giving sermons and people that are apparently religious or knowledgeable. Is that, oh, love doesn't have anything to do with Islam. That, that's a Christian notion and Islam is about justice. Ajib. Islam, yes, is about justice, right? But how could you say that love is not يعني, a part of Islam? That one of my teachers said is that, that, that love is the essence of mercy. Al-Muhabba Ayn al-Rahma. It is the essence of mercy. And so that one of Allah's names is al wudud And if you look at, for those that attended the class on the 99 names that we did here, the the the, the Definition that Allah that our Imam Musadi gives of al wudud, it's actually very closely close to the definition that he gives to al rahim, because they're very closely related, and that the al wudud could be translated the loving kind, right? That he is the loving Subhanahu wa Taala. He's the one that show and gives this wood. So if this is one of the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, uh, that how could there not be some type of relationship between love and the deen? That secondly, that one of the other things that is just entirely counterintuitive, what is the name of our Prophet wasallam? He's the Habib Allah. If love doesn't have anything to do with Islam, then of all the names that our Prophet wasallam could be given, that when we say Habib Allah, that we're saying, we're, the underlying assumption there is, is that he surpassed all of the other prophets and messengers, because why? He's Habib Allah. So in the fact of him being Habib Allah, he surpassed all the other prophets and messengers, which means Muhabba has to have something to do with it, if we're saying that it is through love that he surpassed all the others. Because Musa was Karim Allah, and Ibrahim alayhi salam was Khalil Allah, and, Ma and Noah was Naji Allah, Hakada. Right? So there has to be something in about love. Otherwise, how do you reconcile that? And that even beyond that, if we, if we delve deeper into this, if we say that love is the essence of mercy, the Qur'an itself begins with Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. So there in and of itself, which is the beginning of the Qur'an, and that as some scholars then extrapolate through that, 
that they understand that there is a relationship between the words of Allah and the knowledge of Allah. Right? So you have the, and this is why when we say, I would be that I seek refuge in the complete words of Allah from everything that He created. What, uh, what are the kalimat of Allah? That, uh, and Allah Ta'ala refers to this in the Book of Allah. Are we going off and on here with this microphone? That um, the, there's a relationship between the kalimat and the ma'lumat because is that, that knowledge that in and of itself, that speech points to knowledge. So that when I'm saying something, and I'm indicating to you some type of reality that my words are pointing to knowledge. But it's inconceivable, this is one of the foundations of language, is that even this is what we learn in the very first text that you'll study of the Ajaromiya, uh, that, um, I think the microphone's, uh, but it's not, I know, but the, uh, yeah, um, uh, that it's kalamun, that is has to be mufid. It has to indicate meaning. It has to indicate meaning. Meaning that there has to be a knowledgeable, something intelligible behind those various words that are being said for it to be even beneficial speech at all. So there's a relationship between those two. That anyhow, that this deeper meaning of uh, understanding Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is that at, in the metaphysical sense, is that the Bismillah, in the name of Allah, is that this is how everything is brought into existence. And that the very first nukta, that not below the ba, that when we first start to draw the ba, that this is indicative of the very first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and brought into existence and is only happening Bismillah, in the name of of Allah, meaning that without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it could never be brought into existence. And that this is opens up a huge door for some of the greatest secrets that the elect of the elect of the elect of those who actualize these meanings experience in that throughout the days of their time until the day that they meet their Lord, that then swim in in a very different type of swimming. At one time we were uh, actually swimming uh, the beautiful thing of the teachers in Hadramot is that they are very loving to their students. And we used to go swimming with our teachers. And I can't t explain to you what that used to actually do to you, to actually be swimming with your sheikh. And um, you don't normally, you know, associate swimming with, you know, a teacher. Usually they have so much heba and you're in awe of them. And, and um, that I remember one time we were swimming with w one of our teachers and he looks at one of the students and he says, Hal tusan al -aum? He says, are you a good swimmer? And he, this person thought that he was saying, like, do you know how to actually like physically swim? Can you do the freestyle or whatever, stroke or whatever? And um, he's like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, hal tuhsan al -aum. And he repeated the question. He says, are you a good swimmer? And then finally he picked up that he meant like a different type of swimming. Right? There's outward swimming, and then there's another type of swimming. And just as the buoyancy of water, when you get in water and you start to float and you move around, and that feeling that you have, which is a very pleasurable thing, be in the pool and swimming, is that in the uh, figurative sense, in spiritual sense of swimming in meanings, is one of the most, uh, is one of the best things of all, and just as that one of the best physical exercises for you is to swim physically in water, one of the best spiritual exercises is to swim physically in oceans of mystical knowledge, which this exists, and that even though that we are so covered in sin and trapped down by our pleasures and our desires that oftentimes we don't experience these meanings, they do exist. And alhamdulillah that we still have people to advise us like Hujjat al-Islam al-Ghazali and to point to these realities, point to these realities, point to these realities to remind us and to remind us and to remind us and to remind us. And this is what the nature of these people do is that they remind and they remind and they try to encourage and encourage and encourage and people turn away and they fall short and they turn away and they leave and they come back and they leave and they come back and they just continue to remind and they're patient and they're merciful and hack in hopes that one day that we take our religious life seriously and we do what we need to do 
And no matter how many times that we fall down, we brush ourselves off and move forward, that hopefully out of one day that we will, inshallah, experience some of this beauty. And that one of the early scholars said, as he says, that you never will taste the sweetness of Iman. If someone asked him, is that can someone who commits a sin, uh, who tastes the sweetness of faith? And he said that someone who has even a thought of sin that comes to their mind will never taste the sweetness of faith. Oh, that seems like we have to just give up now and khalas, it's all over. That, yani, ya latif, what are our thoughts like, let alone the things that we all know that we do time and time again. But that was from the earlier period, from the blessing of Allah Ta'ala, is that if you connect to the living representatives of this deen, who are upright and have these meanings in their heart, is that it can penetrate veils and very short sittings with them, that which you could never do on your own. And all of the worship that you do and the books that you read and so forth, the secret of that transmission that comes from heart to heart when you sit before people, who have sat before people back to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is one of the greatest secrets of all of Islam that is still here to this day. This is one of the greatest secrets of all. And that even though sometimes people complain at certain junctures in history why these people aren't more prevalent and why they're not readily available and that we need them and so forth, why aren't they being active and so forth, that there's a wisdom in all this. We have to be very careful before that we enter in our own, what we seemingly are thinking objective opinion into when we look at things. That the reality is, is that, that Allah Ta'ala, that he, the history is in good hands. The very first contention of Sayyidina Abdul Hakim Murad, of all of the contentions, and now there are 15 or 16, and each collection has 100, as he said, is that activism will only succeed when the activists realize that history is in good hands. That's very deep, right? There's this, this is one of the big critiques against traditional Islam. They're not being active, right? The Sufis are the reason that we're in the problems, that, that we're the reason for all the problems that we have. That many of you know exactly what I'm saying. That if you're from many of the countries in the Arab world or even in the subcontinent, you all know exactly what I'm saying. Is that people blame those people, the labels like Sufis and so forth. They are the problem, right? And that, not to say that... Sufis are perfect. I mean, there's probably uh, people that claim to be Sufis that, that have uh, issues and that there's room for improvement and so forth and so on and uh, that we have to critique where critique is needed. However, that to just give make blanket statements about that, not to understand wisdoms and why things happen, this is a big mistake, is that there's wisdoms in why certain things happen. There's wisdoms why that certain people are hidden in our times is that some of the main centers where this transmission was taking place, that many of them, most of them, pretty much all of them, have been systematically dismantled. That they still exist though in pockets. And this is from the blessing of Allah Ta'ala. Yuridun li nur Allah. They want, they want, yuridun, they want, to extinguish the light of Allah. Right? Wallahu mutimmun nuruhu. Allah is going to complete that light. Every time that they think that they are going to sever the secret of that transmission in this place, it comes somewhere else. They sever that tradition and it comes somewhere else. And I remember that my teacher said to Habib Omar that Yemen and Hadramaut in particular, and especially Tarim because it was a place of scholars, went through a very difficult time. And that ended in the early 90s. It was a time where the communists, who actually, they were trained by the Russians, but they were Yemeni. And they went through a very difficult time. Many of the scholars were tortured. Habib Omar's own father uh, was murdered and martyred. Um, that seems some of the scholars alive today uh, were tortured, they were electrocuted, and that many of them fled and um, had to go to uh, places like the United Arab Emirates and to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and, and other places. Uh, to you know, save their own lives, and many of some of them were dragged alive uh, behind a car until they died, and they were dragged through the streets, right in this way. And that, Subhanallah, this is the way they were. But they were rijal. They came to Habib Muhammad bin Saddam, Habib Omar's father, when uh, these things were happening, and they asked him. They told him Habib because he was a person. He was a, a lion. Subhanallah. And they said, you know, you need to stop teaching. They are going to kill you. And he looked at this person and he said, Marhaban bishahada. 
He says, welcome, I welcome martyrdom. Martyrdom is welcome. Khalas. He was a person who, he wasn't going to stop doing what he was doing in Fitlan. And that as the story goes, Habib Omar is around the age of eight. That they were praying Juma that day uh, during these uh, during that time in Masjid al-Mihdar, that famous white minaret that you see oftentimes associated with Tarim, and that they had to check in on a weekly basis with the authorities downtown, so that he went and he put down his shawl next to his son Habib Omar, who was eight at that time around, and then he went to check in, and Habib Omar never saw his father again, and um, they recently, they eventually found out what had uh, what had happened to him, but uh, Subhanallah. That uh, this is, you know, um, part of the story, yeah, but that anyhow, that there are certain meanings that were in the hearts of these individuals that enabled them to do that. That if you didn't love Allah, how could you welcome shahada? Like how could you welcome martyrdom if you didn't love Allah? If you weren't that looking forward to the meeting with your Lord, Subhanahu wa Taala. These meanings that we're going to be looking at are the very essence of the deen. They're at the heart of the deen. And this is why we see a hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Awthaka order to Islam that the firmest handholds of Islam and you hib and you hib fillah wa to when to hibba fillah wa tubgal fillah that that to love for the sake of Allah and to dislike for the sake of Allah. That loving for the sake of Allah is from the firmest handholds of this deen. And that as we will see what Imam al-Zahid is going to do is that he's going to give us the understanding of what love of Allah means and then by extension loving for the sake of Allah. Because love is part of the human condition. That human beings, that we have the ability to love. And that this is one of the beautiful aspects uh, of, of the human being. And there's many different types of love that we experience as human beings. That there's a special love that someone has for their parents. There's a different love that they have for their sisters and brothers, sometimes. There's a, another love that they have for their children. There's another love that they have for their friends. And then there's other types of love that we experience, mundane types of love, right? You, like people love their cars. Their brand new M3s that they drive fast in. They love their houses. They love their jobs. There's all kinds of things that we love. This is part of the human condition, is the ability and the capacity to love. And like everything else in our deen, is that there's also a sacred type of love that is a much higher degree of love in which if that takes place and uproots these other types of love, it puts them in context and connects them to all of, it connects them all to this sacred type of love and that's something that's possible. So that when we say loving for the sake of Allah, that people tend to think that, you know, there's not love there. And if you look at the hadith of the Prophet, what was his sunnah? Is that if you actually tell someone, because you're, you're supposed to, that if you love someone, you're supposed to tell them you love them, your brother and sister. And that if you tell them you love them, right, that I love you for the sake of Allah, what are they supposed to say? <laughs> May the one whom you love for his sake love you. And that someone might say, wait a sec, no, just say I love you back, right? It's one of the ways to test, are you, do you really love that person or do you not love that person? Because that there is a difference between loving for the sake of your own self and between loving for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. It's a very subtle difference. That it's oftentimes not black and white and there's different shades in a sense. Is that the stronger that one's Iman becomes and the more that these meanings become rooted in their heart, the closer that it gets to being connected to this sacred type of love. Which is in a sense the goal because love is the most powerful emotion of the human being. It's the most powerful emotion. Now, if there's any psychologist here, that might be something we could argue, that a lot of research was it show and so forth. But in general, you could say that love is the most powerful emotion. Meaning that if that emotion dominates your heart, is that oftentimes that is going to taint everything that you do, even if in a worldly sense. And this is why that it's narrated to be a hadith, that حُبُّكَ الشَّيْءْ تُعْمِ me. You're me. That your love of something blinds. We even say that in English. Love blinds. That 
as the poet said, "Ain al-rida an kulli aibin kalidatun, walakin ain al-sukhti tubdi al-masawi." The eye of contentment when you love someone is that you don't notice their faults, right? But the eye of displeasure is that yani, even if you have 99.9% things good with you, that 0.01%, خلاص, that's what it's going to notice if someone doesn't love you or like you. And so that love is a powerful emotion. And that this is why that we have this deen in order to not uproot love from the heart of the human being because you can't do that. Right, but it's to transform that love and connect it to something what is higher. And this is in this is the in general in terms of our ethical theory. In other words, the way that we view all virtuous things, all virtuous traits, character traits, is that what Islam gives you the ability to do is is because there are universal traits of virtue. No one's going to tell you unless there's something wrong with them that. Uh, being truthful is not a good thing. But how can we go from merely being beyond truthful for being truthful to being truthful, connecting it to the sacred virtue of being truthful such that the efficacy, in other words, the effect that it has upon us, that it draws us near to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Uzzah is going to touch upon this when he talks about one of the aspects of love. So we'll save that, that conversation for later because it gets very deep. But the point is here at this basic level is that all traits of character that are praiseworthy is that, that one of the preconditions is that one have faith in order to fully benefit from that trait. That in the Akhirah primarily, but also in a spiritual sense in this dunya. Now, in another sense, that in the universal sense, that yes, people that are good, it generally reflects upon their faces, and oftentimes with the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in the world, is that it will reflect upon them in this world as well. Right? That, that the way you treat people is the way that you'll be treated. These are universals. Right? So in that sense, that yes, it applies ac across the spectrum. But in the spiritual sense, is for you to fully benefit from that, meaning that it's a means for the veils to be lifted from your heart, a means for you to draw near to Allah, a means for you to attain nur in your heart. It's a precondition that someone have faith behind that trait. And then secondly, is that they connect that trait to the sunnah of our Prophet Wasallam. And what that means is, is they connect that trait into doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a sincerity of intention behind it. And when this happens is, this is the way that we truly try to transform. Now this is in general, but it specifically happens with love, with muhabba. So this is a powerful emotion, but here, that what Imam Ghazali is going to train us to do is how to turn this emotion that exists in all human beings, that at least potentially, into the highest form of that love, which is the sacred love of the divine, of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what he's going to do, I'm sorry, I know we shouldn't be drinking Starbucks. We should have gotten Pete's. But I heard Pete's was bought out by Starbucks. Is that true? Is it true, Yawan? How would of course have been The only way we just need someone to go meet a farmer in Ecuador or any, yeah, Ethiopia or Yemen. Or actually, that's uh, I, I've. Uh, are there any like real con coffee connoisseurs here? I can say that I found the best coffee. Doctor, are you a coffee connoisseur? I found the best coffee. I can seriously, huh? It that's good, right? But this, there's a friend of mine who who I'm not going to divulge the secret. Then you're all going to run off and make the money, right? I'm going to patent it first, and then uh, I we'll talk. No, but this is because I wasn't like a connoisseur. I used to like laugh at these guys that have like Facebook discussions of Sidi Osama Khan and Sheikh Faraz Rabbani and. Sheikh Abdul Karim Yahya, like having these discussions of coffee on Facebook, and uh, mashallah. Anyhow, that's the own topic in itself. Allahumma salli ala al-habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So where were we? We were talking about muhabba, and we're talking about uh, the importance of muhabba, and that 
how this is what Imam Ghazali is, what he's going to do for us is, he wants to clear up some of the intellectual space. And that this is generally his technique, this is what he does, is that oftentimes with various aspects of the deen, there's barriers between people in understanding the realities of that deen. There's a lot of people that are like this now because they've been misinformed or they've never been properly informed. Is that there's certain things that are between them in, you know, you know why, don't you, why, why, why don't you like spirituality? What is it? There's, there's just sometimes there's barriers between people, or some people, Muslims have been are totally distanced from the Muslim community. They don't have anything to do with the Muslim community or come to the masjid or something. What is it? And oftentimes, when you get down, you speak to them, and they find people that they're open to. Which, to me, in my mind, we should be open to speaking to all these people, and that from within the Muslim community and beyond the Muslim community. One of the most amazing programs I've ever seen on television was. Uh, one of my primary teachers, Havya Adi Jifri, for those who speak Arabic, he did a series uh, in, uh, in Egypt on, um, um, what is it, uh, what's the name of that station? It's a new station. Um, anyhow, I forgot the name, it's a new station. But the series is called uh, Amin to Billah. And he did two seasons of it, now they're doing a third season in Ramadan. And what he does is that he speaks to people from totally different perspectives. He speaks to secularists, he speaks to Coptic Christians, he speaks to feminists, he speaks to yani, all people from all different types of backgrounds that have all different, way, different ways of thinking. And he just has an open conversation with them. And he has a, a way of dealing with it that oftentimes these type of people that have these different ways of thinking is that they don't find an openness from religious people to speak about them. And part of that is because oftentimes those religious people, they and of themselves don't know how to articulate their own beliefs and so what happens is when they feel threatened that they خلاص, it becomes black and white and right and they push them out and that's dangerous especially in our time you know now not everyone has to learn all of this stuff about all these other things but at least if you're not going to do that in and of yourself close yourself off tight but don't push other people away but we need to train people as well though that's going to speak to these people and they're going to be open-minded what you'll find is is that a lot of the things that they're basing their arguments off are completely baseless. And if you sit down and you walk through it and you trace in their own mind how they came to that decision that they made to distance themselves from the Muslim community and you start chipping away, chipping away, well, I agree with that too. I, that's, you're right about that. Right, boom, boom, boom. That e eventually is that they'll find that, that you know, a lot of that is baseless. And this is why one of them said, is that one of the interesting things is that the more and more you get into academia is that you find is that there's certain issues that are facing all of humanity and there's challenges and once you are exposed to that at a much deeper level that you realize is, is that, that the challenge is the challenge but oftentimes for people that are less sophisticated the challenge pushes them away as opposed to recognizing that it is a challenge in precisely what you need to do in that time is to stand up and confront that challenge. That's abstract. What do I mean by that? That an example of that is that we live in a time where it's hard to be truly religious because many of the people that are apparently religious are not truly religious. This is one of the biggest fitting of our time. Is that the people that you think are truly religious Right? are not actually truly religious. The Prophet ﷺ described many of these people. And it's actually very dangerous. And it's a, it's a crisis in a sense. Right? Because that, that they appear to be religious and they're not really religious. But at the same time, oftentimes many of those people that are complaining about those who are apparently religious, that are coming down hard on them, that many of their claims are also, you know, uh, questionable at least right and that that an example of this is I was in this one meeting where there was these uh, young people that were talking about you know the uncles and the masajid uh, what everyone likes to talk about nowadays and that some of the sisters were complaining about the way they were treated in the masjid and so forth type we all know these issues exist we all know the issues of equal prayer space and so forth and, and we all understand all of that but one of these sisters who was bringing this up, that it was like late at night, 11 o'clock at night, then all of a sudden she goes home or walks off with one of these young men 
and neither one of them are married and they're young. So I'm like, wait a sec, you're complaining and a lot of your complaints are justified. But that what you're complaining about is never going to actually really materialize because at the same time we're not going to open up the doors for people just to do anything that they want to do. And this is much of the story of the Arab Spring, not to oversimplify things, is that a lot of what they are, you know, yes, you know, Mubarak, no one needs to say anything else about that. But much of what people want to be in place of that is not according to the Islamic ideals whatsoever. Right? That if our understanding of freedom is that people that can dress what they want and drink Starbucks and eat Kentucky Fried Chicken and just completely accept the globalized world, right? that to me is a serious problem. Right? That anyhow, that, 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 you know, so, so in, you know, that, that this, you know, that, that oftentimes you find is that many of these things are baseless. And this is why Imam was that he does this and he did such a great service, <laughs> that he wants to clear the intellectual ground and to deal with all of these issues so that there's no preventatives between someone, then that they can accept it. Because there were debates about the concept of love and the, philosoph the philosopher's notion of love and even some of the theologians' notions of love, as we will see and is coming, inshallah ta'ala. But the final point we'll make here is that I, I really want this all to be crystal clear for all of us is that love is not only a part of Islam, it is the foundation of Islam. It is the essence of Islam. And it is the summit and climax of Islam. That this is essentially what it is all about. It is about love. This is the whole matter. And so what Imam al is going to say here is that this is the end of the entire path. And in a sense as well, that it is the beginning of creation because the creation began with Rahma and love is the be love is the essence of Rahma. And it is the end of the very path that we know in the Hadith Qudsi, Fa'ida Ahbabtu, and that if I love him, and then everything that comes after that. So love is central to all this, and this is why that the great scholar and saint Sidi Ahmad Zaruk that he said that Ilam in the Ruh al Islam Hubbullahi wa Hubba Rasulihi wa Hubb al Akhirati is that the spirit of Islam, the spirit is what? If you take the spirit out of someone, they're dead. The lifeline of Islam, the essence of Islam is what? It is the love of Allah, the love of the messenger of Allah, the love of the akhirah, of the next world, and the love of the righteous, that this is the essence. And without this, is, a, is that you have people that profess faith, but there's no reality to that faith. There's no vitality to that faith. And so inshallah ta'ala with that, that we will inshallah that uh, embark upon this text. And um, the, the, the last thing that we'll say is that um, this book deals, book 36 six deals with love, long intimacy and contentment. Now that uh, we would need about 12 sessions to finish the whole thing. And that would be moving quickly and not even being able to read every single line, but just the most important parts of each chapter. But we're going to save uh, longing, intimacy, and contentment for part two. That t Today we're just going to deal with love, and then those three we're going to save to a follow-up discussion. And the reason why is, logically, is, that, is that, that love leads to these other three. In a sense, they're fruits of love and signs of love in the, in the, in the same sense. But they're, after someone has love that they lead to these other three. So we will talk about those. If Allah Ta'ala extends our lives uh, a, another time, inshallah Ta'ala. So let's uh, begin. <clears throat> and by the way, this book is translated by Eric Ormsby and uh, published by the Islamic Text Society. So this is the book of love, longing, intimacy, and contentment being the sixth book of the quarter of the saving virtues. And this is the prologue. In the name of God, the most merciful, the compassionate. That praise be God, who has exalted the hearts of his saints above all concerns for the vanities and the glamour of this world. 
who has purified their inmost beings from regard for anything but his presence, who has singled out their hearts for devotion on the prayer rug of his grandeur and disclosed to them his names and his attributes so that they shone with the very fire of knowing him, who then revealed to them and unveiled to them the splendors of his face until they burned in the fire of his love, and who then concealed from them the essence of his majesty, so that they wandered astray in the desert of his glory and his might. Then, whenever they trembled at a glimpse of his essential majesty, he darkened it with such astonishment as dust, as dust the surface of both reason and perception. At last, when they were about to give up in despair, they heard a summons from the pav pavilions of beauty. Patience! O oh, you who despair of gaining the truth because of your ignorance and your haste, and so their hearts remain suspended between rejection and acceptance, between denial and attainment, at once drowned in the sea of knowing him and scorched in the fire of loving him. Uh, when Sayyid al Habi Omar used to quote lines like this from the books of the authors of this nature, he said, uh, This is a language that we don't know. And that even though you can translate it, that it's one thing to translate it, but it's another thing that, I mean, Imam Ghazali is articulating, you know, very deep that mystical experiences that he himself is going through. You couldn't speak like that if you weren't experiencing that. People simply don't speak like that. And that this is a language that, that is of a dhaiq, someone who's experiencing uh, these realities. And one of the the great aspects of the Ahlul Madin is are his introductions, and the way that he lays down in his introductions, essentially, that with, through what's called Baraat al Istihlal, everything that he's going to talk about, right, in the remaining part of the book, and the way that he began here is that who has exalted the hearts of his saints above all concerns for the vanities and the glamour of this world. This is one of the first things that he'll go on to mention about one of the great ways to attain the love of Allah is that you have to detach. Because your container can't be filled simultaneously with two different types of fluid. That you only have one heart. And the more love of the world, the less love of Allah. The more love of Allah, the less love of the world. And then he goes on to describe all of these states that go along with love and what it leads to. And that this is how he begins. And then he says, An abundant blessing and prayers upon Sayyidina Muhammad the seal of the prophets in the perfection of his prophethood and upon his family and his companions, lords of creation, imams and leaders in truth, uh, in truth and its reigns. So how does he begin? That He says that love of God is the ultimate goal among the stages and the supreme summit of the steps. This is how he begins. Is that love of God, that it is the ghayat al-qusuwa, that it is the highest thing that you could possibly attain. And that it is the dhurwat al-ulya. And it is the supreme summit of all of the very, he says here, steps, darajat, or degrees. And that this is how he begins. Very succinctly and very convincingly. And that commandingly, that love is, this is it. It is the utmost goal. It is the supreme summit. And so it's a problem that so, there's so many Muslims alive today that don't believe that, one. Two, it's even worse that with people not having that be common knowledge is that we're not embarking upon a path to these realities. And uh, this is why, is that they say, is that these scholars are a proof amongst, to, uh, they're a proof upon the common folk. And the Arifin, the knowers of Allah, are a proof upon the scholars. And that because of uh, what they experience and that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with is that, that for them there's no room for doubt in these issues, that they know them certainly. Through a knowledge that is that not even able to be doubted. So he says, there is no stage beyond the grasp of love that is not one of the fruits and one of its consequences. So meaning this is the end all, is love. 
everything that comes after love are just its fruits. Like what? Like longing, shok, longing. That there's certain things that we long for. That we oftentimes long for worldly things. When was the last time we longed for something lofty, something mm. spiritual? Right? That we might have felt a sense of this. You know, when you go to Medina and Munawwara, when you go to see the Kaaba and Musharrafa and Mecca and Mukarrama, you do long. But when was the last time we had longing in this sense? That intimacy, uns, contentment, and the like. So these are all fruits of it. But then, nor is there prior to love any stage that is not preparatory to it. Such as repentance, toba, patience, sabr, and renunciation, zuhud, and the like. So he's saying here is that everything that comes before love leads up to it. That you can't truly attain a, the maqam of mahabba, the station of love, until that you've also attained these previous stations that come before it. Now, again, this is not for us to despair. This is a lifelong path. And that when you have a state of love, that you have a particular instance where you feel a deep feeling of love towards Allah Ta'ala or towards the Prophet Sallallahu or towards someone righteous or towards a blessed place or something. This is a great blessing of Allah. And that when those start to increase and increase and if someone treads the spiritual path and they do the necessary work that they need to actualize the stations that come before them so that repentance moves from just something that we do that once in a while to where it's a station is that we are penitent by our nature our hearts are broken, that we're constantly repenting, is that our hearts have prostrated in the sense that we've hum humbled ourselves before our Lord, and that when you've actualized, not just in one emotion, in one, in one instance are you patient, but patience just pervades that all of the situations that, that face you in your life, and then also gratitude, the same thing with, with, um, with hope and raja, with fear and hope, and asceticism, zuhud, that tawakkul, trust in Allah, all of these are preconditions for someone to attain the maqam of mahabba. Again, that you can attain some of the fruits of love that even by connecting to people at the early stages of the path, but where it becomes your state, where it no longer then changes. This is exactly what the word maqam means, is that, that qama yuqumu, right, is to stand. Right? A maqam is it's a station, meaning it's a point where it's fixed at this point. It's no longer moving. That, that a, a state is something that's transient. It comes and it goes. But once it becomes stationary and fixed, is that that is then who you are. And everything that you go through after that point is determined based upon right, that fixed nature of this trait that, was, that, that is in you. And he says... Attainment of the other stages is rare and yet they are possible and hearts are not wholly without hope of them. But even the belief in love of God the Exalted is so scarce that one scholar even denies that it is possible. So here he goes. Is that the, the, uh, the what Sidi Ali al Ta'i mentioned yesterday about uh, Aristotle is that, is that his understanding was lo of love was very different from ours. And that the idea of his understanding of God, that God being so distant that it was impossible for the human being to love God and they, in any real sense. Um, that likewise is that, that um, there are Muslim philosophers as well that had similar types of understandings. And there were even Muslim theologians that said that human beings can't have hub haqiqi or muhabb haqiqiya, real love of God. Is that Love, in a sense, is ta'a, it's obedience. It's not, it is not, it is not a, you know, true love, whatever that is, because that we'll find when we come to define love in the next chapter, it actually is a difficult thing to define. What is love? Right? You can uh, describe it oftentimes by its results and its fruits, but positively defining love, what is the nature of love? That is not something that's actually easy, and uh, we will get into that next session. But this is what he says for now, is that <clears throat> such that they feel that he states that love has no meaning apart from persistent obedience to God the Exalted, and that genuine love is inconceivable except between the same genus and species. 
Okay, and, and that part of the reason that, at least the theologians, we won't even get into the philosophers, That's we'll save that for another discussion. But even the rightly guided theologians who describe the love of Allah Ta'ala as ta' as obedience, that their intention behind that was tenziyah, is that they had a good intention and it was to protect our belief from thinking that Allah is like His creation. Because normally, that just as when we think of the attribute of sight, for instance, is that, that in order for me to see something physically with the eye the way that we normally see, that there has to be something else physical that I'm seeing. But just as that you could have a vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that bila kayf walan hisar, right, that is not restricted to the time-space continuum and it doesn't have modality, that Likewise is the same thing with hearing the speech of Allah Ta'ala. Likewise, the same thing is also in the sense of love. Is that, that and this is what Imam Ghazali is going to go on to explain, is that their intention was that if you define, if you have that premise, then in order for there to be true love, is that there has to be the same genus, meaning they're of the same sort. Okay, they're both human beings, for instance then that obviously you would say oh, there's no way that you can truly love Allah Ta'ala because obviously Allah Ta'ala is entirely and absolutely different from His creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When such as He deny love, they also deny intimacy and longing and the pleasure of the munajat, of these intimate conversations and all other concomitants and effects of love for this reason, it becomes necessary to lay the whole matter bare. Khalas. He's going to lay this out for us. And that in a very comprehensive, systematic, scholarly fashion, that while in the midst, that you'll see a, a mystical thread in everything that he does, is that he weaves into his scholarly discussions that uh, t by taking tangents, that ways to attain everything that he's talking about. And he goes on these, these tangents as well, where he points to that what are called ulum and mukashafa, knowledge, uh, that the ilm and mukashafa, knowledge of unveiling. But he made a commitment in the first part of his book to only deal with ilm and mu'amala, that knowledge of practical dealings, knowledge of that practical knowledge that we can, that will lead to this other type of knowledge. But in a sense that he, in his mystical threads, that he points and excites us to know that these things really exist. And just when you think he's about to divulge it, he stops. And it makes you say, the point of that is, it's a rhetorical advice, like I should really work on myself so I could experience what it is that, that he is uh, explaining that can be experienced. So he's going to mention here the different chapters, and he says in this book we shall cite explanatory, pro expl uh, explanatory proof texts from Revelation on the subject of love. We shall then explicate its true nature and its causes. We shall also explain that there is no one who truly deserves love except for God the Exalted. We shall explain as well that the greatness of all pleasures resides in the gazing upon the face of God, and that there is an even greater pleasure of gazing on His face in the life to come as a compared to mere knowledge in this life. The exposition that follows this six will deal with the means to strengthen love of God the exalted, and that in turn will be followed by an account of the disparity among, in the, among people in the matter of love, a discussion in chapter 8 of the, in, uh, the inability of the human mind to know God will come next, followed by a consideration of the means of longing. After that, we shall discuss God's love for His creature. Then a discourse on the signs of human love for God will ensue, followed by an explanation of the meaning of intimacy with God. Then he'll get into contentment. For time's sake, we'll skip over that. And he closes that um, with uh, various stories and sayings that, res re that relate to uh, and those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, we're going to because of the way that we're breaking down these sessions we're going to have a slightly different uh, breakdown and we're going to be pulling some chapters forward and pushing others back uh, in order to, to try to inshallah at least get a sense of what he's trying to say here uh, in this book so inshallah I guess we will pause here at this juncture and come back inshallah and look at the uh, uh, begin with chapter 1 on the proof text which is essentially are the shawahid, that the proofs from the Qur'an and the Sunnah 
about the importance of love. So we'll stop here, inshallah. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi nahya wa alayhi namut wa alayhi nub'ath, inshallah. It's one of the great uh, practical ways to really bring about love in our hearts for our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala when you say la ilaha illallah and that you bring to mind all of these meanings that we're thinking of is that you bring into mind all of the meanings of the ihsan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the goodness that he shows towards us and you'll find that each meaning that you bring to mind that your heart literally just love will pour into your heart for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you think about our existence and all of everything that we've been given and all of the blessings, this is what our Prophet said. He gave us the key to love, which was Ahibullah Lima Yagrukum bihim and That love Allah for what He provides you from His blessings. That's the door that opens up to then the love that comes from the reflection upon the manifestation of His names and attributes in creation, which then now open up to the door that is even more subtle, which is the Munasib Khafiya, which is the subtle affinity and that, that those moments of uh, that we spend uh, showing love in our hearts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's like uh, that the statement that we uh, quoted earlier is that that having that moment the weight of a mustard seed of love as Yahya Sayyidina Yahya ibn Mu'ad said is dearer to me than 70 years of worship without love so um, this is the the last session um, now you know, like usual, it always happens. So we should have just advertised that we're only going to get through, you know, a few chapters. Um, it always ends up happening. But um, we will make a promise, bi idhnillahi ta'ala, shibh wa'ad, yani not a full wa'ad. That we'll make a, we'll find some way to finish this book eventually if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, extends our life. Um, that and you know, we have to come back again to finish this. And um, in this last session, we do want to leave uh, time for questions, and we have to stop at, I guess, 6.15. So uh, we will maybe just take uh, the section on the love of Allah Ta'ala for us. And then if we do that, we've accomplished a lot. We've accomplished the heart of the discussion. And then that we can follow up at another time, inshallah, in some of the chapters that come after that. And um, I would highly recommend that everyone get this book. Avoid the introduction, there's no reason to read it. Get right into the uh, book of Imam Ghazali. And even the marginal comments here, I wouldn't even read them. There's no use. Just read the text of Imam Ghazali. And um, uh, that another uh, really good book is, the. it's in a sense an abridgment. It's, it's Kimya al-Sa'adat. He wrote it in Persian, and it's 40 volumes. But it's uh, also, but it, it's 40 books, but it's in two smaller volumes. And it's also been printed by Kazi Publications. Each book's been printed individually. And um, that, uh, that uh, it's, it has the same title, but it's much thinner. So I would highly recommend that you at least get that. If not, you can get uh, this book in the longer version. Essentially what that is, it's an abridgment, and a lot of the technical terminology is, is taken out. It's, it's a bit easier uh, to access. Um, so, inshallah, we will finish up and we'll jump to chapter 10, which is titled An Exposition of the Meaning of God's Love for Men. So, we talked about the meaning of our love for Allah. Now, we're going to speak about the meaning of the love of Allah Ta'ala for us. He says, No that proof texts from the Qur'an attest to the fact that God loves man. We must understand what that means. Let us begin with the proof texts about His love. Allah says He loves them and they love Him. Allah also says Allah loves those who do battle in His way. Allah says Allah loves those who repent and He loves the pure. That Allah rejects anyone who alleges that He is beloved of Allah and He says, Say, why does he punish you for your sins? Anas reports of the Prophet ﷺ that he said, When Allah loves a man, sin cannot harm him. He who repents of a sin is like one without sin. Allahu Akbar. If that's not, you know, that's, if that's not the only reason why you should love Allah, subhanAllah. That when Allah loves someone, sin cannot harm him. He who repents of a sin is like one without sin. And then he recited, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God loves those who repent. Inna Allaha 
يحب التوابين. What a beautiful deen we have. Is that Allah loves the tawabin. That He didn't say, subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمَعْسُومِينَ Allah loves those who are divinely protected, although He loves those who are divinely perfected. That the bar is lower than that. He loves the tawabin. So meaning is that be tawab. That when you take one step forward and ten steps back, or two steps forward and fifty steps back, and oftentimes this is our state in this crazy world in which we live, is it just be tawab? That is all you have. Be tawab. Be tawab. Tawab is someone who repents and repents and returns and returns and never quits. Just be tawab, and then take the bashara from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. In Allah, you have tawabin. He loves those who repent time and time again, and that even if you continually fall into sin, in Allah you have tawabin. And this hadith attests to this meaning as well. In the same way. That this means that when a man loves Allah, he turns to Him before he dies, and his past sins, however numerous, do not harm him. In the same way, past disbelief does not harm after conversion to Islam. Right? And the way you convert, خلاص, Islam, you jubbu ma qablu. Everything is wiped out that comes before. In a similar sense, if you are tawab, is that you won't leave the dunya except that Allah Taala will that you know. Remove all of your sins, you know. But we need to have those environments that where we're encouraged to make tawbah, you know. Allah may forgive, may, may make forgiveness of sins conditional on love. For He says, "Say if you love Allah, then follow Me, so that Allah will love you and forgive your sins." And He also said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah gives the world to those He loves and to those He does not love, but He gives belief only to those He loves." This is the true scale. So as dusty and disheveled and as poor as many of the Muslim countries are, and living in tents, and yani you go and you know, khalas. That if they've been given iman, khalas. That's the criterion. If those who've been given iman, that's the greatest sign of all that Allah Taala loves them. Just minus all of these other social distinctions that people have. If Allah Taala has honored a particular people with Islam, that's a beautiful sign for those people. Even though they might have historically gone through centuries of oppression and difficulty, if Allah Taala has honored them with this sign, Subhanallah, as a sign that He loves them, Subhanahu wa Taala, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that whoever humbles himself to Allah, Allah raises him. Whoever, but uh, in who, whoever, uh, whoever humbles himself to Allah, Allah raises him. But whoever glorifies himself, Allah abases. And Allah loves whom who thinks of Him much. And he said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam." God says, "A servant consistently draws closer to me through supererogatory prayers until I love him. When I love him, I become his hearing by which he hears and his sight by which he sees." Zayd ibn Aslam said, "Allah subhanahu wa taala may come to love a man to such an extent that his love for him even reaches the point at which he says, 'Do whatever you will, I have forgiven you.' <laughs> it's not my shit. Do whatever you will, I've forgiven you." Allahu Akbar. When Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan brought, when he brought to prepare that army, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? لا يضرر Uthman ما فعل بعد اليوم Allahu Akbar That nothing that Uthman will do after this day will harm him. And SubhanAllah, that even that one of the people of Badr that happened what happened in the fitna that took place and the letter that was sent, it was apparently treachery. And what did our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Now, as it, as it, perhaps that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has looked upon the people better and said to them, do what you will because I've forgiven all your sins. SubhanAllah. That there's, you know, this, you know, if you become beloved to Allah, you know, and this is why one of the great du'as, oh Allah, make our sayyat the sayyat of the mahbubin and the muhibbin. That make our sins the sins of those who are beloved to you. Because they'll be forgiven, you know. And in the way that if you love someone and they, you know, do something to you, you know, even human, you know, human beings are like that. You'll overlook that, what that person did, much more so than if you have spite in your heart for that person. Okay. Now, numberless are the sayings handed down about love. We have already stated that man's love for Allah actually exists. It is no mere metaphor. It's real. By linguistic convention, love, muhabba, denotes the soul's inclination for a thing that befits it, whereas 
Ishq, passionate love, is the term for an overmastering and exuberant inclination. As we have further explained, goodness befits the soul, and so too does beauty. And beauty and goodness are both perceptible now to sight and now to insight. Love is consequent upon both of these, but, not, is, is, but is not distinguished by sight. Allah's love for man cannot exist in, 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 it cannot exist in this sense in any way. Quite the opposite. All terms when applied to Allah and to other than Allah are not to be uttered unequivocally with reference to each either. Right? What this means is that, that when you, for instance, speak about the, you, the, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the only thing that exists when we talk about the existence of Allah and we relate it to our own existence is the linguistic convention of what we understand existence to be as a concept. The reality of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is entirely different from our reality. Now, we can compare our existence to the existence of plants, for instance. But when we talk about everything in relationship to the Creator, whether it be love or whether it be existence or any of the attributes for that matter, is that you know, we're talking about two things that are entirely different by their nature. So what does this mean then? In linguistic convention, love designates the soul's inclination towards what is fitting and congruent. But this is conceivable only in a deficient soul which lacks whatever is congruent with it. Accordingly, it wishes it to perfect itself by attaining that missing thing and delights in attaining it. In God's case, this would be absurd. All beauty, perfection, glory, and majesty are possible in the case of divinity. Since each is present, actual, and necessarily existent for all eternity, neither cessation nor renewal is even thinkable. Okay. Then he goes on to say, the interpretation of the utterances transmitted about Allah's love for His servants refers to what? Refers to the removal of a veil from the heart so that one sees with his heart into Allah's enabling a person to draw near to Him and Allah's willing for Him to, uh, and, and Allah's willing that for Him from eternity. That is what it means for Allah Ta'ala to love us. Is that the removal of the veil from the heart? That the servant drawing near to Allah Ta'ala? And Allah willing that for the human being? That from eternity. That's what the love of Allah Ta'ala means for us. And that the second one, drawing close to Allah, what does that mean? That the closeness here is not in relation to space. It's a closeness that one perceives, it experiences rather, at a heart level. That we already mentioned that Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein, and closer to us than our ability to even possibly postulate or think about His closeness to us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But along with that, that exists as a reality, but do you perceive that or do you not perceive that? Being aware of that and experiencing that, that, that closeness of Allah, that's closeness to Allah. And there's some people who it becomes their state and then their station where they're conscious of that at all times. And that this is what leads them to say. And one of the great imams of the Ba'adwi tradition, Sheikh Abu Bakr bin Saddam, that when he wrote his book, Miftah al saraya which is a beautiful book, the keys uh, to the inner secrets, that he says at the age of 17, there's nothing that he saw before it or during it or after in it, except that, he's, it, that he saw the divine impact upon creation in relationship to that thing. It says literally in Arabic, except that he saw before it, in it, and after it. And what he meant by that is, is that he was in a state of witnessing his closest to Allah before something, during it, and after it. This was his state when he was 17 years old. And he lived from the age of 9, he lived from 919 into 992. So he lived, mashallah, tabarakallah, uh, that a total of that 79 years. And at the age of 17, Akada, that was his state. So what was his state at the age of 20? What was his state at the age of 30? What was his state at the age of 40? What was his state at the age of 50? That's his state at the age of 17 years old. Imam Al-Aydurus Al-Akbar used to say that Mundu khalaqani Allah that mal tafattu ila ghayri Allah. How kind of hard is that? Yani? He said, from the time that Allah created my heart never inclined to other than Allah. Subhanahu wa khalik. There's people that are like that. If these are awliya of the ummah, what do you think about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Yani if awliya of his ummah attain this, what about the Prophet? 
You know, why do we mention these stories? We mention these stories, it's enough to love these people. We mention their stories because we love that. If that doesn't engender love, what will engender love? It's enough to love these people. Mir Mahadan, that poem you recited, Mahabbathum Sa'ada. The mere love of them is felicity. You will only have love in your heart if Allah Ta'ala has decreed that you are a felicitous person. That the mere love of the awliya and the salihin, that there are people that say, yes, ittiba, 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 and almost to the extent that what's the use of love if you don't follow? Hey, marhaban. True, perfect love has to follow with ittiba, where you act, there's a following of the person you love. That's true love. But it's a mistake to try to discourage people from having love. Right? Even if there's no following, that love itself benefits. And we were talking earlier that when you come into the majadis of khair, that there's numerous narrations that there's one of them states that a person who attends gatherings of dhikr, even if they come for an ulterior motive, they didn't even come for the majadis of dhikr, that stand up forgiven, all of your past sins have been changed into good deeds. And then the angels ask, what about so-and-so who came for no reason? Other than that he came for no, he didn't come sincerely. He came with an interior motive. And what that he's also forgiven. There are people that the people will never be doomed to hell. They'll never be doomed to perdition if they sit with them. Right? These people, these are the people of Allah. How could we not want to be in their gatherings? The love of, of them benefits in and of itself. Merely the love. And it motivates, it propels, it's one of the greatest things that you can possibly have in your heart is love of the awliya and the salihin. That it's one of the greatest, if, if that can become firmly rooted in your children's heart, alas, is that you will find that a intense fortress of protection. As that even if they, you know, a shabab short bemen and junoon, that, that yani, uh, youthfulness is a branch of insanity. You know, they will go through their own stages. Uh, we all know what we've done when we were young. But if that love is there, it will draw them back. It will pull them back. It will gravitate them back to khair. And that, you know, there's other deep realities that are associated with this love that are not befitting to even speak about. But this is very, there's very, this is very real. So closeness to Allah is a closest of meaning, not of actual distance. So, his love for one whom he does love is everlasting, whether linked with the eternal will which decreed enabling that person to embark on the path towards divine proximity, or whether linked to his action of stripping the veil from his servant's heart. For this veil is merely temporal occurrence, which comes about through the intervention of a necessary cause. As God himself says, My servant shall not stop drawing near to me through subrogatory prayers until I love him. So, we have to know first that the veil can be lifted from the heart. That's the first step. Secondly, that we have to take a path to put ourselves in a position, a means of what he's saying here, for that to happen. And that while we take the path is that we ask Allah, we ask Allah, we ask Allah, recognizing that who are we to even ask for such a great thing? And that we completely deem ourselves entirely insignificant, but we also recognize that we have Allah, a Rabb, and we have a Lord, and He could grant us that. And that you know, part of our good opinion of our Lord is, is that He will grant us that. And if your heart becomes attached to it, that it's very likely, before we take our last breath, this will be the state. Through supragatory prayers, His inmost self becomes purified, the veil is removed from His heart, and He attains the level of proximity to His Lord. This is all God's doing as well as His grace. This, then, is the meaning of His love. This may under be understood only by a parable. A king bade his servant approach him. Because he liked him, the king gave him permission to be present at any time on his regal carpet. This may have been so he could help him prevail by his might, or in order to refresh himself by looking at him, or so that he might consult with him for advice, or so that he might prepare various foods and drinks. It is safe to say that the king loved him. This means that he inclined to him, since his friend had within him some affinity corresponding to himself. Hence, he drew the servant close to him. He did not forbid him to enter his presence, not because he wished to benefit by him and not because he sought his aid. It was rather because the servant himself was befittingly endowed with pleasing manners and praiseworthy traits that he could approach the monarch's presence. And because of his closeness, he prospered. 
The king had no designs on him. When the king lifted the veil between himself and the other, it might simply be said that he loved him. If the other acquired those praiseworthy traits to such an extent that the veil ended up being lifted, it could be said that he gained access to the king and made himself lovable to him. Allah's love for men exists solely in the second sentence, not in the first. The parable holds true in the second sentence only on the condition that your mind not anticipate any alteration in Allah whenever newness to him is renewed. The lover is close to Allah, but this closeness is contingent upon a corresponding distance from the appetites embodied in the beasts of the field, wild animals and devils, as also upon modeling one's behavior on the noblest character traits, which are divine traits, closest to God, lies in attribute rather than in physical location. Okay. And then he goes on to say, To the degree to which man perfects his traits, consummates his knowledge by grasping the true nature of things, and consolidates his strength by subduing shaitan, restraining his appetites and purifying himself from vices, to that extent does he draw closer to some perfection. So then, God's love for man lies in his drawing near him, and out of himself by warding off distractions and sins and in purifying his inmost nature from the spots of this world and lifting the veil from his heart until he sees him as though he saw him with his very heart. Man's love for Allah lies in his inclination to seize this absent perfection which lacks he, which he lacks. He yearns for what he lacks. Whenever he grasps some part of it, he delights therein. Love in this sense is unthinkable for Allah. And that with that, insha'Allah ta'ala, uh, that um, we will uh, wrap up our discussion and open up the floor. Uh, if there is um, uh, any questions, let me see if there's anything else that we want to add um, to, you know, summarize this, is, is that, that love is the essential part of the deen. And if you want to give a, an overarching description through which that you could describe the state of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who learned from the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that they were people that were people that were completely overtaken by love is that the liver of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq used to that uh, there used to be a smell that would exude from it and that it was burning and they say that there's different opinions but some of them say this is because of his overwhelming love for Allah and his messenger that there was companions that would sit at home and they would think about the Prophet ﷺ and they would be so agitated that they'd have to go out and they say, Ya Rasulullah, I just had to see you. That there was others that said, that would describe themselves, that when they would think about the Prophet, Ka'anni majnoon, as if I'm, something's wrong with me, as if I'm a madman. That Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu, we all know his story, that he said, Ghadan, that Al-Qadi Hibba Muhammadin wa wa farhata, what a joyous occasion death is. That tomorrow that I'm going to meet those people that are beloved to me, Muhammad and his companions. And that Allah Ta'ala, through His grace, has given us the righteous as a means for us to learn how to love Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the great mercies. Because by learning to love the righteous, you can learn to love the Prophet Sallallahu And by learning to love the Prophet Sallallahu that you can learn to love your Lord, tabaraka wa ta'ala. And that that feeling that dominates the heart even before we take our last breath to long to meet righteous people in the world is that this is one of the great uh, that, that feelings that someone could have before they die and there's a hadith that states that إِذَا حَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَ جِبْرِيلَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحْبِبَ that, or أَحِبَّ that if Allah Ta'ala loves someone is that he will call out to Jibreel that and say that indeed Allah loves so and so, so love him. For you hibbahu Jibreel, then Jibreel will love him. For you nadi Jibreel fi ahl samat and then Jibreel will call about amongst the inhabitants of heaven, in Allah you hibbu falan fa hibbu, that indeed that Allah loves such and such a person, so love him. For you hibbahu ahl samat the inhabitants of heaven will then love him. Thumma yulda' lahu al qabul fil ard, and then that acceptance will be placed that uh, he will, the acceptance will be placed for that individual that in this earth and this is something that happens and that you know this is we hope that our names will be called out and what kind of human being is this 
that reaches a state where Allah Ta'ala loves him and then that after that, that SubhanAllah, Allah commands Jibreel to love him and then Jibreel calls out and tells the inhabitants of heaven to love him. What kind of individual is this? Walking on the face of this earth that is made of flesh, blood and bone, and bone but this is the reality. And that we will close by saying uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu that every single aspect of his greatness and that everything that he did, all of his traits, all of his uh, feats, all of his accomplishments Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everything, his deeds, his worship, his knowledge, that all of that has to be seen in the light when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says about Sayyidina Musa, وَاسْتَنَعْتُكَ نِنَفْسِي that in Surah Taha, that, that Surah Taha is one of the names of the Prophet and Allah Ta'ala begins in the beginning of Surah Taha Taha ma anzalna al-Qur'ana alayka litashqa that we didn't, that reveal the Qur'an to you in order for you to be miserable and that he then goes on after the initial verses to describe the, the story of Moses alayhi salatu salam and that one of the things that he says as that Moses comes to the uh, burning bush and then he says inni ana rabbuka faqla'na alayka innaka bil wadi al muqaddas tuwa indeed that i am your lord that take off your two sandals indeed that you are in the sacred valley of tuwa wa ana akhtartuka that i have chosen you fastami ma yuha so listen to what you're going to receive of revelation and then Allah Ta'ala speaks in the first person to Moses, Innani an Allah. Indeed, I am Allah. Innani an Allah. That Fa'budni wa qim innani an Allah. Fa'budni wa qim as salat al dhikri. That so worship me and establish the prayer for my remembrance. And then there's verses that describe when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that commands Moses uh, that um, that uh, in, in relation to the staff, uh, and that uh, that he that he asked that وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى قَالَ هِيَ أَصَايَ تَبَكُّ عَلِهَا وَهُشُّ بِهَا غَنَمُ لِيَا فِيهَا مَآلِبُ أُخْرَى And they say that he prolonged that his response to this because he's in a state where Allah is speaking to him. And the leather of khitab that he wanted to enjoy this. So he actually prolonged, he didn't say it's هِيَ أَصَايَ that he went on, he asai, at tawakku alayhi wa hushubi ala ghanamiliya fiya ma'ali wa ukhra. Qala alqiha ya Musa. And Allah Ta'ala commanded him to, uh, that cast down the staff. And then he cast down the staff. And then Allah Ta'ala says, khudha wa la takhaf. That take it and don't fear. And that one of the, Sadiheen told me one of the meanings of that is, is that the ha here, the staff, one of the meanings is, there's numerous meanings, is that it represents the asbab, all of the means. And that if this is someone's state where they're entering into their affairs, Billah, خُدْهَا وَلَا تَخَفْ And I was asking this person, particular individual advice uh, about uh, getting involved in something. His whole point is, خُدْهَا وَلَا تَخَفْ the, All the asbab within the realms of the shara, خُدْهَا وَلَا تَخَفْ Take it and don't fear. سَنْعِيدَهَا سِيرَةَهَا الْأُولَى Now the outward meaning is the staff. That we will return it into the way that it looked previously. But in relation to the asbab, that whatever it is that you enter into, that if you enter into it for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala will make it of benefit to you regardless. Obviously if with the condition that it's according to the shara. And then that the story goes on, and then he's commanded to go to Pharaoh, and then he says, He asked for Aaron to be with him, and then Allah Ta'ala grants him that. And then there's a few verses that deal with that a summarized version of Moses' life. And Allah Ta'ala says then in verse 39, mahabbatin minni. I have cast love upon you from me. وَلِتُسْنَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِي اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ And Allah Ta'ala says that in another verse, إِنَّكَ بِعْيُنِنَا And subhanAllah of all, you know, there's times Say to Habib Omar that he has a very blessed way of recitation and that he has a qira'ah in a sense that it's part of his irth of Rasulullah that is mufassira. The way he recites in a sense that 
comments on the verse. And one of the verses that he almost always stops at and repeats is the verse when Allah Ta'ala says, Innaka bi'ayunina, in relation to the Prophet Sallallahu That indeed, that you are under our supervision. Innaka bi'ayunina. And they say that this refers to the haqiqah of the Prophet Sallallahu And then after Allah Ta'ala mentions a few verses in the summarized uh, version of Moses' life, وَاسْتَنَعْتُكَ nafsi, Allahu Akbar That I have chosen you for myself This is the Lord of the world speaking وَاسْتَنَعْتُكَ I have created you I have chosen you for myself Meaning that everything that Moses went through from being born, being put into the river, and being taken into the palace of the Pharaoh, and then killing the Egyptian, and then that, then fleeing after that, in the Exodus, and all of these events of Moses' life, the time that he spent in marrying the daughter of Shu'aib, and then come all of those events of Moses' life. That all of them was the natukani nafsi. Allah Ta'ala put him through all of that, and in the reality of all of that was, was the natukani nafsi. I have chosen you for me. And this is the essence and this is why this, this, this part of the story of Moses is in Surah Taha. And it relates to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of the events of the Prophet's life, and by extension his ummah until Yawm Al-Qiyamah, has to be seen in that light. Is that, that the Prophet's greatness, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the greatest aspect of his greatness was his being beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And all of his achievements inwardly and outwardly, all of them have to be seen in that light. And this is this quintessential thing that relates to you and I or anyone else. And this is what makes this different than any other discourse that you hear on the face of this earth. Are these meanings. That if someone attains that, they've attained everything. And everything else is entirely insignificant in comparison to this. What's the not to cutting nafsi? That this should move our hearts when we reflect upon these verses. And that hopefully that we will take the path of the awliya and the salihin to lead and follow in their footsteps inshallah ta'ala and that even ya Arab, a portion of these meanings that Allah ta'ala that sends down upon their hearts may we at some point in our lives inshallah that without anything that we deserve and all of our shortcomings attain some of that sweetness inshallah ta'ala and um, inshallah let's uh, I know we're supposed to leave more time for questions if there's any quick questions uh, that people have and then we have prayer at 6.30, so. Inshallah. Oh, I was going to say you guys were easy on me. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there was areas where they don't discriminate on um, the dunya earnings, but they love you more so for how much you love the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But you didn't mention where they were, so I was wondering where can we find these places? Uh, yeah, they exist in pockets. They exist, mashallah. They exist. And uh, you have to just find those pockets of people that are like-minded. And our time to find one person like that is... is one person like that is a great, great blessing. Let alone two or three, let alone four or five. This is what I'm telling you. This community here, you have to give shukr. You have to give shukr. If you don't give shukr, the blessing will be uh, taken from you. You know, if I were you, I would imprison this man, Say Tarif, who's right here. I'm embarrassed to even speak about these meanings in front of him. He is someone who, uh, mashallah, experiences these meanings and knows the true people of them. I'm, I'm embarrassed to even speak about them in front of him because he sat with the real people. That he was from the Muqarrabeen of Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Ramadan Abuti, of the living Shaykh to this day. And um, that it's a, you know, if I were him, if I were this community, I would imprison him. Ustaz Murabit had plans to do that. I wouldn't let him travel. I would cage him in and, and trap him here. And then that. The people that are around him are people of those meanings. I have no doubt about that. They're here. They're in this community is blessed, and um, that uh, that when you find them, that you have to you know adhere to them. But there are people here, even in this community. Mashallah, tabarakallah, uh, males and females, and that you seek them out and that build upon that. And every time that you find people that uh, want to come into that as well and experience that, you know, alhamdulillah. Inshallah. She had her, I'll come back to you. Uh -huh. uh, even last night, uh, you said that you have should be in the com uh, company of 
uh, quality and um, even if they gave you know, get the spiritual benefit and after they pass away do we have a connection with them and can we have intercession through them when we Absol go absolutely yeah that you can have a connection with people that have returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without doubt. You have a connection to the Prophet sallallahu and he returned to Allah, the Sahaba and the awliya of the previous times. And that there not the, there's different types of intercession, but without doubt that there are people that will intercede for others. The Prophet said about that Sayyidina Uwais, is that he would intercede for the number of the tribes of Rabia and Mullah, which has a large number of people. And by extension, many of the great awliya, that they are able to intercede for large numbers of people and so that they can definitely have intercession for sure especially when they pass away even more so when they pass away because they no longer have taklif they don't have the legal responsibility of the entering here in this world so actually when they enter into the barzakh that um, the fact that they don't have taklif that scholars particularly mention that 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 connecting to them is 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 even more meaningful while also connecting to the people of the time yeah. how about our parents do they pray for us? I keep hearing that your parents, you know, they are with you, their spirits are, uh, you know, they know what's going on with you in this world and they yeah. pray for you. Yeah. Still pray for you. Yeah. Is it possible? Is it's possible? totally possible, yeah. To what extent? Is there some conditions and that type of thing? Is it general or specific? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I'm not sure. But they can pray. And and it's possible, yeah, without doubt. What is the exact way to understand that? Allah. Okay, sorry. My, uh, my question was about the repentance you said mm -hmm. that we can repent and our previous sins are forgiven and we keep repenting I mean is it uh, you, you can't be doing the same sins over and over again either so there has to be some you know how do you qualify that repentance it has to have some you know a uh, little more uh, no, absolutely yeah. Yeah, any, how do we what, that, what's the true repentance that true repentance the Tawbah Nasuh Right? That, uh, and this is one of the great du'as of Allah Matuba alayna tawbatin nusuha. O Allah, relent towards us and grant us a tawbah, a sincere repentance. To zakki bina, to zakkina biha qalbin wa jisman wa ruha. Through which that you purify that our physical bodies, our hearts, and our spirits. And that a tawbah nusuha is a repentance that you repent and you never return to that sin ever again. Right? And that's a sincere repentance. And that the important thing is, is that. We're all weak, right? And that there's different classifications of sins. Sins that through which that we are vying with the lordship of Allah Ta'ala, like arrogance and so forth, that from the human perspective, that those are very dangerous sins. Sins that we fall short in, in terms of letting our nafs get the best of us, that those are much easier to forgive. And that we... Uh, oh, I thought you were coming to see me. That... Uh, 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 you know, those are, you, people have nafs, you know, and it's very difficult to overcome the nafs, and that you have to do your best. In other words, that even if you repeat the same sin 70 times a day, and you attempt to make a sincere toba, that you're not considered to be musir, a persistent sinner. They mention that in particular in the books. You do your very best. A sincere repentance means that you don't ever go back to that sin again. But even if you go back to that sin again, that you make an intention in that moment when you commit that sin, even if you have, there's a high level probably you're going to do that same sin 10 minutes later. In that moment, repent. And in the next 10 minutes, repent. And you won't do that sincerely except some point Allah Ta'ala will remove you from that condition. Right? So don't let the fact that you're weak and you continually fall into that sin repent you, prevent you from repenting. That even if there's things that you're struggling with in your deen, that you know the next day that you're going to commit that same sin, and that morning repent, before, during, and after. And if you're sincere in that, that eventually Allah Ta'ala will take you out of that, if you're sincere. And that's why you can never despair, ever, 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 ever despair. To me, one of the most beautiful aspects of our deens, Allah has made despairing from His mercy a major sin. It's a sin to despair. And so never despair. Repent in return. Repent in return. And that without doubt, a true repentance is you never return. But even if you return, that you keep repenting. You keep repenting. Hopes that Allah Ta'ala will eventually, because you don't know. Maybe you'll take a lot, your last breath and you died in that state of repentance. And, uh, 
shaitan tries to get you to think that I'm going to commit the sin anyway tomorrow, so why repent? It's not a real repentance. That's from shaitan. Now, in that moment, you know, really make a sincere, have a sincere desire, even if you're weak, and repent. So it's connected to the same as um, you know for the for the um, love of Allah. We have that concept, um, but also in our practical life, like I have um, seen people who say that okay, we do love Allah, we say our prayers, and we we'll go to Hajj. But they may have, you know, in their business or whatever, they can still cheat and lie. But they consider that because they love Allah, they can still be forgiven for all that. So I. I mean, I sometimes wish that we would talk more about those parts as well, uh, especially in some instances where people, I think, somehow take away the practical, uh, you know, parts of our life that are very important in showing how much we love Allah or follow the, you know, right. the dictates that Allah has given us how to live the life. Without doubt. No, I, I, nothing I said today yeah. should be understood to detract from what you just said. Without doubt, you know that that the reality of love is is an itiba. Without doubt, and that the Sharia is the Sharia, and you call people to the Sharia, right? However, that still, it's like there's two ways of looking at things. You have Muslims that never come to the mosque except through Eid. You can look at that in two ways. You could say that, khalas, these people never come to the mosque and criticize them, or you could say from a different perspective. At least they're coming to eat. I would rather them. Ha I would rather them come to eat than not have any association with Islam whatsoever. At least they're coming to eat. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the, the hour won't come until people never say in the earth, no longer say in the earth, Allah, Allah, right? That you know, I used to be a because I've had a very privileged, you know, to be around people like this, you know, from the beginning of my Islam, that. When I was at UC Berkeley, I was exposed to people, Muslims, that I was like, oh my God, like, I was so shocked. Some of these people, like, I don't know if they've ever said la ilaha illallah once in their lives. And, you know, the blessing of our Lord, you just say la ilaha illallah once in your life, sincerely. But eventually you will be a person of paradise. Right? So that there's two ways of looking at things. And... That simultaneously, while we, while we encourage people to follow the Sharia and to give rights, and at times you have to, because if they're taking people's rights and they're cheating, no, you have to come down hard at certain points to warn them and to, from what they're doing. But as you warn them and so forth, is that you never make them despair from Allah's mercy. You know, I would, I would, it's like they asked Sheikh Abu Bakr bin Saddam, is that what do you do if you make dhikr and that you never concentrate in your dhikr? And some people might tell you, what's the use of it? Don't make dhikr. Shaykh Abu Bakr says, Allah. He said, say, thank Allah Ta'ala that He zayyina jarihatim min jawarihak bi dhikri. He said, thank Allah Ta'ala that He made one of your limbs at least remember Him. He said, because even if you're only mentioning Allah with your tongue, that your heedlessness not making dhikr is greater than your heedlessness making dhikr. So in a sense that, yani, obviously that's not the ideal state. The other state is to be present with Allah and to have adab and so forth. But there's always two ways of looking at that. So it's, both are true in a sense. But at the end of the day, that um, I just have a lot of compassion for the people of the time. It's very difficult. You know, I had a deep conversation with this, like with Sheikh Faraz, and that we were, we were talking about like how difficult it is for Muslims in, excuse me for mentioning countries, in places like Syria and in Pakistan and in yani India and these, like in other places in Afghanistan to live an upright life and just to, just to not take rushwa and to be in Egypt and to actually have an honest income and not have to pay someone off and not to do something haram to make your business like it's very difficult now Allah Ta'ala will give you a makhraj if you're a person of taqwa absolutely but it's hard for people right the bureaucracy and the red tape just to get the simplest thing done is hard for people so I, you have to I, our time you have to have a soft spot for people and a deep mercy while at the same time principle is principle you know so you know, but what happens is if people don't have that mercy and they come down on these people, they push them away further. You know, and that 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 becomes the difficulty. So the fine line between, you know, the two is you know, there's a time and place for everything.
You think that we take Toba too lightly. I shudder to think of Ka'ab ibn Malik's repentance for having procrastinated a critical moment. He wasn't forgiven for 40 days and nights. How can we know if we are forgiven? Um, that, that's a sign of Iman. That if you're shuddering to think of that, then Allah Ta'ala has blessed you. And that fear is one of the testimonies to the state of your heart, which is a good thing. And that should make a shudder. If we really knew our Lord, that we should be shuddering. The, the mercy comes in that realizing we live in a time, as our Prophet ﷺ said, is that were we to perform one-tenth of what we've been required to do, we'll be saved. Otherwise, if we look at what we should be doing, that la ilaha Allah, that it would lead to despair. You know, so that should be our worry. You know, and, and that we should think about that. And that's a, that's a good state. As for how to know uh, if we're forgiven, you know, that you know, there's, there's, there's signs that, that, that we can know that. That one of the most outward signs is, is that our scholars say, is that if you fulfill the conditions of toba of repentance, that they say you can have certainty that you are forgiven. They mention this in the books. That if you have remorse for it, that you stop doing it while you're doing it. You intend to never do it again. And if it relates to an act with someone else, that you, wrong, that you write that wrong, that they say you can come, you can know that you're forgiven, and you can be, you can be, you can, uh, you you can be sure that you were forgiven if you fulfill the conditions of toba. But then the question: Did you fulfill the conditions or not? Yeah, so there is still in that sense. But having said that, one of the greatest signs is is that Allah Taala moves you out of that state, and He takes you into a a better state. This potentially could be one of the signs uh, that that your repentance uh, is. Uh, is accepted and that then after that that you're in a state of purity and you don't ever think about that stuff again and that if that you still think about it that you should have it cause in you you should remember the uh, the pain associated with that sin to cause you and protect you from going back in it a second time so I think we should uh, stop here inshallah okay. That is as that is Allah <laughs> 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 